thank you guys all so much for participating in the poll. Um, at this time, I'm going to now introduce Melissa O and Courtney Cello, who are going to be our presenters for today's webinar. Melissa O is a policy analyst for the Substance Use Disorders Project at Community Catalyst. She conducts research and analysis on healthcare policy. Melissa works with state consumer advocacy groups to expand the use of screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, otherwise known as SBIRT, to address substance use disorders among youth and young adults. She formerly worked at the Center for Social Innovation, where she brought best practices to the field through accessible and engaging training and innovative online tools. She provided the technical assistance to SAMHSA Homeless Services Programs and instructed courses nationwide on numerous topics, including outreach and enrollment and critical time intervention. Melissa was a research analyst and project manager for the Nas for National Institute of Mental Health Study on the effectiveness of online learning for dissemination of evidence-based practices in community-based settings. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Gettysburg College and a Master's in Social Work from Boston University School of Social Work. We also are going to have Courtney Cello presenting today's webinar. Courtney is from the Children's Mental Health Campaign at the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. Courtney did work on the ground in Massachusetts to get the legislation introduced and passed and has worked with schools in the early stages of implementation. So again, I just want to welcome everybody, and Melissa and Courtney, if you guys are ready, I will hand things over to you. Great. Thanks, Jess. I think we're ready. All right. Awesome. Great. So I will kick us off here. So um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm Melissa. I'm with Community Catalyst. Um, for those of you not familiar with the organization, um, we're a nonprofit advocacy organization um, working nationally to elevate consumer voice, making sure the healthcare system works for everyone, particularly vulnerable populations. Um, so we work across multiple issue areas and oops, trying to get my slide to advance here. Let's see if I can do that. Uh, all right, there we go, we're back. Um, we work across multiple issue areas. Uh, one is substance use disorders, and under that program, uh, we have funding from the Conrad Hilton Foundation, and under that project, we work on an initiative to make drug and alcohol screening and counseling more available to young people. Um, our, uh, um, our model and our focus is specifically on advocacy, so instead of um, direct implementation, we're working to change policies and systems and um, creating uh, the type of change that will create an environment for expanded use of um, youth prevention tactics, particularly SBIRT. Um, so our advocacy goals for this project um, include expanding the locations where youth access SBIRT and the providers who deliver the screening, brief intervention, and treatment referrals. Um, so in addition to expanding that locations, we also work simultaneously to establish sustainable funding streams to support this work. Um, so the, the hope is that we're creating systems where there's funding going to this and it's being prioritized and um, the actual use of the practice of SBIRT is expanded. So our specific model on the way we approach this is we identify state-based consumer health organizations um, in um, various states um, and those partners in turn uh, develop coalitions and um, identify uh, policy champions and um, you know, work to expand the use of SBIRT in their states using whatever tactics and whatever strategies makes the most sense in their state environment. Um, so our, our model includes subgranting and providing coaching and technical assistance and um, connecting states with one another and with other, other innovative practices going, around, going on around the country in terms of advocacy. Um, so right now our program focuses primarily in California, Georgia, Massachusetts, New Jersey. Uh, we previously worked in Ohio but have wrapped up that work recently and, um, and Wisconsin we've continued to work in as well. Um, so that's where our focus is these days, but we of course provide support across other states um, and um, but this is where our primarily our primary project is. 
This is a fun little snapshot of our uh, policy work and how we see it all coming together to create policy change around SBIRT. Um, so starting on the bottom left, uh, you'll see um, coalition building. So our states at the onset of this project, many of them uh, started this about four years ago, developed coalitions um, across substance use disorders, advocacy organizations, um, addiction treatment providers, schools, um, other um, policy maker champions um, within the state as well, and um, pull together these coalitions to move forward their policy agendas. One of the big things um, that we uh, focus on is communications. Um, so you can see here on the bottom middle of the screen some great graphics from our partners in Georgia. Um, so a big part of this is educating the community. Um, in order to make policy change, um, community members need to be educated about the importance of youth prevention and understand what SBIRT is, um, that tricky acronym, um, most of the time not using the acronym SBIRT, but you know, trying to explain and um, communicate the, the need for these upstream approaches. Um, so our advocates develop um, you know, easy to read and accessible materials on both the model itself and on their campaigns. Um, if you swing up to legislative champions, um, one of the things we um, have done is pull together a learning tour where advocates actually brought policymakers to Massachusetts to learn from um, the model here, um, and that resulted actually in two great champions um, in the states of New Jersey and Wisconsin. Um, so a big part of this is developing those go-to champions at the state level, um, whether it's someone who has an influential position on uh, you know, a certain committee or someone who's the go-to in the state for healthcare or drug and alcohol issues, um, developing those champions is a, is a key part of the policy campaigns. Um, and then swinging left to sustainable funding, um, our states have looked a lot at Medicaid. I know that's a big topic around on these webinars and among the um, individuals here joining us, um, looking at the use of Medicaid to support prevention. Um, so our states have looked a lot on that, um, as well as some other innovative um, approaches through state budgets, um, county ordinances, um, looking at expanding the use of um, private insurance codes, um, and I'm happy to go into any of those specific sustainable funding advocacy strategies if there's interest, but I will uh, leave it at that for now. Um, and then uh, swinging up to the top here where we have policy wins and expanding expert in schools. Um, the biggest policy win, um, you know, that we've seen in, the, in this campaign is in Massachusetts where there is a law requiring all middle and high schools to use SBIRT um, to screen um, and provide brief intervention and referrals to treatment in the middle and high schools. Um, that has resulted in the expansion of SBIRT in schools, um, both in this state, we've also seen the expansion in other, um, other states as well. Um, so this is a little snapshot of a, what our um, what our model looks like and how we've um, you know, what our journey has looked like so far to creating policy change. Um, and as in Massachusetts, we've seen other states also focus on schools and school-based health centers as their area of focus. Um, at the beginning of this project, we didn't prescribe where states should focus their um, policy agendas, but it, uh, many of them have. Uh, focused on schools and school-based health centers um, because you know, this is an area where even students who are disconnected from perhaps mainstream services, they're not going to the pediatrician's office or um, aren't engaged in other health care services, um, this is an area to reach a big segment of the population um, and in an area where young people are surrounded by trusted adults. So I'm going to pass this off to Courtney, who's going to talk, uh, she's going to go deeper into the success in Massachusetts um, and share some lessons learned about the advocacy uh, done in uh, here in Massachusetts. So Courtney, I pass it off to you and I will virtually give you control as well. And Courtney, it looks like you are muted. There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so thank you, Melissa. Uh, so just to sort of transition real quick, um, based on sort of the success that Melissa just shared, uh, and then I'll go back and do a little introduction. 
uh, Massachusetts now requires that all of our school districts verbally screen students for drug and alcohol use. Uh, there had been, uh, at the time the mandate passed, eight school districts that were providing SBIRT in schools. Uh, at this point, about 250 new school districts are implementing SBIRT. Uh, and about 150 districts are preparing for ESPER implementation. So those numbers are a little rough. Uh, there have been a lot of trainings ongoing. Uh, the nice thing about the approach that was developed here in Massachusetts through our Department of Public Health and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed uh, is that the districts are really able to personalize their implementation planning. Uh, they receive a lot of training and technical assistance through the Department of Public Health and the Massachusetts Expert Training and Technical Assistance Program. Uh, so there's really a variety of timelines for the districts as they make sure that they have all the resources and training in place that they need. Uh, so here in Massachusetts, our uh, project to uh, expand the use of Expert is called the Addiction Free Futures Project, uh, and it sits within the Children's Mental Health Campaign. Uh, so the campaign is a coalition of families, advocates, healthcare providers, educators, consumers uh, that is statewide and dedicated to creating a system that ensures that every child in the Commonwealth receives the highest quality mental health care. Uh, and for us, in the past 10 years as a coalition, that has really been mental health focused. Uh, so the addition of the Addiction Free Futures Project really makes us a behavioral health campaign. Um, it was an exciting area of growth for us, and we were uh, glad to jump at the opportunity when Hilton and Community Catalyst uh, brought Espert to our attention. Uh, so the campaign here is led by five organizations, the Massachusetts Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children, Boston Children's Hospital, Health Law Advocates, Healthcare for All, and the Parent Professional Advocacy League. We have about 160 supporting organizations. Uh, so we are an advocacy coalition. Uh, so I'm going to really focus in today on the advocacy that got us to uh, statewide school-based effort, uh, as opposed to talking about some of the program design implementation or the evaluation, since that is not our wheelhouse. Uh, but we'll focus on the strategies that you see. So, you know, as a coalition, the Children's Mental Health Campaign utilizes coalition building, policy development, legislative and budget advocacy, uh, including sustainability, uh, administrative advocacy, and communications to move forward all of the projects that we work on. Uh, and this one is no exception. So you'll see these woven throughout the presentation. Uh, so, the Addiction Free Futures Project was an opportunity for us to really look at the table that we were convening and see who else we needed there to be able to shift our focus and incorporate adolescent substance use prevention. Uh, so we formed a leadership team that meets on a monthly basis by phone, quarterly in person, uh, and brought in some of our partners we've been working with for a long time, but we also were able to expand and bring in some new folks You'll see some of those uh, logos and names up on the screen now. Uh, really want to highlight that we have focused on bringing in some of the community coalitions that are working on substance use prevention and making them part of this umbrella. Uh, we focused on engaging the recovery community, uh, including the Mass Organization for Addiction and Recovery, uh, and Learn to Cope, which is actually an organization for parents and family members of individuals struggling with substance use disorders. Uh, we have also worked with the Mass School Nurse Organization. I'll talk a little bit about engaging them throughout the presentation. Uh, and we've worked to engage youth as a core part of the work. Um, I also should mention they aren't a formal coalition partner, but uh, we really engaged very uh, closely with our State Department of Public Health, uh, particularly the School Health Services Division and the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services. Uh, they were the ones who partnered with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed in the state uh, to really innovate and develop the pilot to be able to 
test whether we could adapt SBIRT to be utilized in Massachusetts public schools. So wanted to mention their work. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have worked to center youth voices in this work. Uh, we engage a youth advisory group to help to inform the work that we're doing. Uh, we professionalize their engagement, so we uh, work to make sure they all had a job description, that we paid them for their time in a way that was uh, appropriate and demonstrated the value of the work that they were doing um, through gift cards and stipends. And we also made sure that they had the support that they needed from adults uh, who we tried to ensure were at least near peers, uh, so young adult leaders who were able to give them guidance um, and really uh, otherwise, you know, if support was not asked for or needed, uh, stepping out of the way and really letting the youth lead uh, their advisory group uh, and give feedback as they felt was appropriate. So, uh, as Melissa started us off with, uh, it, we were able to take a pilot here in Massachusetts and develop that into a statewide advocacy campaign. Uh, so when we launched the Addiction Free Futures Project, uh, there was a small pilot underway. Uh, at the time, about six school districts had implemented effort to demonstrate its adaptability to the school setting. Uh, so the school nurses were doing the screenings, and then some combination of the school nurse, guidance team, other school health staff, as appropriate, were being trained to do the brief interventions and follow-up uh, and, as necessary, referrals to treatment. Uh, so at that point in time, with the funding that was available for expert pilots in schools, uh, there is the capacity to add about two or three small to moderately sized school districts per year. In Massachusetts, we have about 405 school districts, uh, which means that it would take an inordinate amount of time to bring them all on board at that rate. So seeing the success of the pilot in the districts that it implemented and knowing that the school nurses, the administrators, teachers, parents had really embraced the model uh, we saw the opportunity to pursue a dual strategy to increase the use of ESPER in other districts. Uh, so first, we looked to the state budget and we wanted to make sure that we were putting resources in place. So we made a request for an additional $40,000, which would be able to support the about 10 new school districts per year uh, in implementing ESPER. Uh, of course, even at 10 school districts a year, if you do the math, Today's high schoolers would have their AARP cards by the time uh, we actually saw full statewide implementation. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we had another strategy to uh, sort of speed up that timeline. So we also filed standalone legislation, working with a couple of legislators in the House and Senate. Um, filed a bill that would require all districts to utilize ESPERT uh, with an estimated cost for full implementation at $2.2 million. Um, which again, for about 400 school districts across the state is pretty lean dollars to implement statewide. So uh, the standalone bill key components, uh, the bill required all public schools to screen for substance use using a validated tool. Uh, it called for screenings twice, so once in the eighth or ninth grade, up to the district's discretion, and again in 11th grade. Now this piece was a little controversial. Uh, we went back and forth a lot with advocates, with experts, with community members who were engaged in substance use prevention work. Um, if you put 10 different adolescent substance use prevention, treatment, and recovery experts in a room together and ask them to tell you what two ages are the ideal to do expert, you will get 10 different answers at least. So this was sort of a averaging out of all of the responses that we got and the coalition was able to agree, uh, as were the legislators who filed, that those seemed like the best compromise. Uh, it also required reporting of de-identified screening results to the Department of Public Health so we can continue to monitor what implementation looks like uh, and do some targeting across districts. And then screening results 
are not recorded as part of the student's record. So we wanted to make sure that it was explicit in there that uh, that was the case. These are all, so with the exception of the specific grade levels, these are all things that DPH was already doing with their model in training the school nurses and school health teams to do SBIRT. We wanted to make sure that those good examples were codified as we look to implement statewide. Uh, so that was January 2015 that the bill was filed, uh, and at that time we also made the budget ask for the $40,000 and began our months-long advocacy there. Uh, and then the bill was scheduled for a hearing uh, in July of 2015. Uh, so when the hearing was announced, we decided to hold a public launch event at the State House with speakers from the campaign members of the Addiction Free Futures Project, substance use disorder experts, uh, and individuals in recovery, including a youth from one of the local recovery high schools who was really, I think, the gem of all of the presenters uh, who really quieted down the room and shared their story in a way that was compelling and appropriate to the environment and really, I think, brought home for a lot of the policymakers in the room why prevention is so necessary. Um, talking about how they really wish that they had had somebody who had just once approached them and asked them what was going on if they were doing all right while they were struggling with uh, substance use disorder. Uh, so in conjunction with the launch event that we held before the hearing, uh, we distributed infographics that folks could use on social media. Uh, we developed a hashtag for the day that folks used. We released a podcast in conjunction with the Clay Center on what the Addiction Free Futures Project was, what SBIRT is, uh, and why it's needed in Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, by the end of the event, we had about 120 folks in the room with some overflow. Uh, press turned out. There were several stories about the event and the hearing. And really, all that demonstrated was that there was a real need for prevention resources and tools that was not being met. And so there was a significant amount of interest uh, in SBIRT and the bill. Uh, for the hearing, we coordinated themed panels to testify. We really wanted to make sure that we had a variety of perspectives, including especially parents, youth, and people in recovery. Um, and we made sure to sprinkle those panels throughout. Uh, with the researchers, the trainers, the school nurses, the advocates, because their voices were the most compelling. Uh, and so at the end of the hearing, the legislators uh, actually gaveled into a formal session, uh, and they gave the bill a favorable recommendation so that it would move forward onto its next committee right at the end of the hearing. Uh, we joke in policy land that that's like having your first date engagement and wedding on the same day. It doesn't usually happen quite that way. So we were grateful to see that momentum and excited to carry that on. And these are a couple of the infographics that we shared via our social media push and were able to update uh, sort of throughout the life cycle of the bill. Uh, we adapted that and continued to share those out. So then, uh, later in 2015, late September, uh, Governor Baker's uh, administration had put out a opioid task force recommendation report. Uh, we had been meeting with some of the task force members to weigh in uh, and were pleased to see that school-based screening was included in their recommendations. Uh, we continued to meet with legislators to build support for our standalone bill. Uh, including all the legislators on relevant committees like children and families, mental health and substance use, and public health. Uh, and then a little later in 2015, uh, early October, the Senate announced a special committee on opioid prevention, treatment, and recovery options, which was charged with developing an opioid omnibus bill. Uh, so that bill was being drafted uh, by this committee, which was chaired by Senator Jen Flanagan, who also happened to be the bill sponsor on the Senate side of our uh, standalone expert bill, which was 
serendipitous. Uh, so we began meeting with members of her committee to push for uh, the prevention in the name to mean more than just Narcan, uh, which is up to that point one of the primary things that folks have been talking about in policy spaces when it came to prevention. And as we all know in this space, Narcan is preventing loss of life. It is not actually preventing a substance use disorder or substance misuse and the many other collateral consequences. So we really want to make sure that primary prevention was a part of what they were doing uh, and they did commit to that uh, and ultimately rolled in a uh, number of the ESPER provisions from the standalone bill with some changes, uh, including language uh, that the screenings may include questions regarding tobacco use. Uh, it made it clear that they were to use verbal screens with tools approved by DPH. This was around some concerns about how the screens would be administered, wanted to make sure that the language was specific enough that uh, there would be no sort of written record with the student's name attached, but we also didn't want school districts that wanted to use iPads for the S2BI. Uh, or an anonymous sheet of paper that had information on the back for the student. Um, we didn't want that to be cut off for them. So we added the with tools language. Uh, there was also a, the two big changes were switching it up instead of defining grade levels, leaving both grade levels at the discretion of the school districts in consultation with DPH. Uh, and there was also strengthened confidentiality language put in place. Uh, but of course, there was some pushback. Uh, so there were some misunderstandings around what ESPERT is. Uh, and I think that when folks don't understand what ESPERT is, a couple of things that happen are, number one, fears about privacy uh, and safety, and then number two, fears about the cost or time burden uh, of doing ESPERT. So you'll see there were some comments made by our Speaker of the House uh, believing that ESPERT might be uh, a violation of students' constitutional rights. Uh, and the governor was concerned that we were literally calling for blood draws to test whether or not students had been uh, using any substances. So we brought out our messengers. Uh, so we mobilized our team. At this point, we really engaged the Massachusetts School Nurse Organization formally and got them to issue an endorsement, which went a long way to alleviating concerns about this putting an additional burden on school nurses, which is one of the things that had come up from a number of folks, none of whom were school nurses themselves. Uh, we kept an internal master list of FAQs along with uh, responses and explanations for each one that we were able to share with folks who were sort of identified as our spokespeople, uh, including legislators and their staff uh, and some of our coalition members. Uh, and we really found that show, don't tell was vital with ESPERT. So in addition to getting an op-ed uh, and doing a social media push, getting constituents to call and email their legislators, we held a briefing at the State House and did a live demo of ESPER. So we had a screener come in and actually do a SBI, including an RT, with one of our staff members who volunteered uh, to be the student for the day. Uh, and I think that really helped to clarify for a lot of legislators the low intensity of the intervention that we're talking about. Um, and I think helped to assure folks that this was a, a thoughtful process that would be you know, strength-based for the students and not something that was targeted at getting folks in trouble. Um, and also wouldn't be something that would be an enormous burden on the schools to implement. Um, as all this was going on, we also used it as an opportunity to mobilize folks to call into their legislators about the $40,000 budget ask that we were still pursuing. Uh, so we got folks talking to their legislators and to their local school officials uh, and ultimately got that $40,000 passed in the budget. And without a mandate in place yet, more than 100 districts actually applied 
to utilize that funding for training and technical assistance, including the three largest school districts in the state. Uh, so again, really demonstrating for legislators and for us the real dearth of resources that were available at the time and how desperate schools were to be able to make use of those tools. Uh, and I think uh, the result of our advocacy, the governor and others uh, who had expressed concerns, uh, whether publicly or privately, uh, did ultimately sort of recant or revise their initial statements uh, and came out in support of effort. And so that led to the legislative victory. You know, we were able to uh, maintain the pieces that we had hoped to see, and there were a few additional changes. So in the final bill, uh, the legislature made some changes so that uh, one, DESI was also directly named as one of the bodies that would be able to weigh in around uh, which grade level should be screened. Uh, it was clarified that screenings must be universal at the chosen grade level, that students may not be singled out or cherry picked, which is very important and true to or the spirit of ESPERT uh, and the way that we all know it works best. Uh, but it was very an important change to make sure that that was uh, there in the statute. Uh, it was also clarified that parents and guardians or the students may opt out of screening at any time, up to and including when the student is sitting there for the screening being asked questions. Uh, they maintained the piece around uh, potentially adding questions around tobacco use, uh, but again, have, still have to use a approved, validated screening tool. Uh, it also uh, had another round of strengthening in the confidentiality language. That was one of the pieces of the legislation that was, I think, most improved through the legislative process uh, with amendments and negotiations between legislators. Uh, what started off as Pretty good confidentiality language is now really ironclad confidentiality language that really protects the student's autonomy while making sure that there is still the opportunity for the school nurse, school health team to keep students safe uh, if they really are uh, struggling with a substance use disorder or are misusing substances in a way that could be life-threatening. Um, and the final big change is that it was left subject to appropriation, uh, which means that school districts don't have to man don't have to utilize ESPER if they don't have the resources in place. Uh, and we absolutely agreed with that change. One of the problems is that we have made throughout the time we were advocating for ESPER in schools was that you know we really didn't want schools to be burdened by this. We wanted to make sure that they had all the resources that they needed, and if they didn't have those resources, that we were there to advocate for them to uh, be able to receive them. Which leads me to the last piece, which is that advocacy doesn't end when a bill is signed. Uh, so we continue to advocate to make sure that there's funding in place. Uh, we were fortunate to secure $1.1 million uh, each year in the fiscal year 2017 budget and the fiscal year 2018 budget for the state. Uh, and school districts have been humming along uh, with the various trainings, with the technical assistance that they're receiving and with their implementation planning. Um, we also have been uh, monitoring implementation to ensure districts have the support that they need. So knowing that you know, not all school districts are the same and that we have some school districts in the state that are very tiny and very rural, and we have some districts in the state that are very large city school districts, and then everything in between, uh, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. And what's working in a school district in Boston, Massachusetts, is probably not going to work quite so well on Cape Cod and vice versa. So we want to make sure that as those things are being highlighted and raised that we are able to take those needs to the legislature and make sure that if there are policy changes that are needed or if there are different or uh, enhanced resources that they need to be able to implement 
uh, or to be able to continue to do experts in their setting, uh, that we are there to advocate for those changes and those resources. Um, you know, one of the things that we're also looking at there around sustainability is with the CMS clarification of the free care rule and the opportunity for schools to have a path to Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, there's a long road and many challenges there. That's a whole other webinar, uh, but that's another opportunity for this to be even more sustainable for our school districts. Uh, and we do expect, I should mention, that that $1.1 million a year for implementation is going to decrease substantially over time once all the trainings are conducted because then it will really be training for turnover, uh, which is very low among school nurses, pretty much universally. Uh, and so uh, we look forward to continuing to advocate there and to making sure that those resources are in place year over year. Uh, if folks are interested in implementation, as I said, that is a space that we don't work directly in. We are supporting districts through policy and resources, uh, but if you want more information about what Im implementation looks like here in Massachusetts, I recommend massbert.org slash schools. That's the Massachusetts Training and Technical Assistance Program for SBIRT. Uh, they have been doing all the trainings around the state, and they have a ton of resources uh, online at that site so that you can uh, do some digging there, and if folks want to reach out, uh, about some of the specifics, I'm happy to try to answer any questions there as well. We'll turn it back over. All right, thank you all so much for participating while um, both Courtney and Melissa were presenting. And thank you to you, Melissa and Courtney, for um, doing such a great job today. Um, I do think, Courtney, there were most of the time while you were presenting, Melissa was answering a lot of the questions. But I think there was um, one that we were going to kick to you. Um, let's see here. So it was about the health teachers and how they were in, involved. Um, Melissa did mention that um, in other states, other pro other professionals are used for screening in um, BI. In New Jersey, they're looking at using school counselors. In Wisconsin, some schools use outside drug and alcohol treatment providers who work in collaboration. Um, so do, do you have any more input on how health teachers were involved? Uh, so not health teachers specifically, but to give an idea of sort of the team approach here, you know, school nurses have been viewed as being the school health staff that are at the core of this. So our school health leaders um, really have been the ones pushing uh, within the districts to get implementation done. Um, the trainings that are offered, there's there have been Expert 101 full day training, and that has actually been opened up uh, for the multi-district trainings to the school nurses, the rest of the school health team, including counselors, uh, but they've also invited other school staff to participate in those as well. So any teacher who's interested, including health teachers, um, have been invited to take part in those trainings to learn more about expert. Um, you know, there has been, uh, I think, a push to get schools to think about how expert fits in timing-wise with that, what else is happening in the school environment. Um, though I think the formality of that varies district to district. Um, so school nurses, or sorry, the school health teachers should certainly be aware of the trainings uh, and that SBIRT is coming up. Uh, the districts tend to do it uh, over the course of a week or so and have a per diem nurse covering the school nurse's desk while they do the screenings. Um, I think some, we've heard from some districts that they've tried to tie that in with the school health class curriculum, um, but other districts might not uh, have quite the same ability to time it that way. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, and there was another question that it looks like I think that I received privately, so everybody um, was unable to see it. But they were asking what screening tool and brief intervention package are you using? Um, assuming that it's the craft and teen intervene respectively, but would like to know more for sure. That is a good question. So I think the, the majority of districts in Massachusetts at this point, I believe, are being trained in the craft, uh, though I think some are utilizing the S2BI, which is the newer screen that actually uses the craft questions within the BI portion. Uh, I am not sure which BI package they are using um, for specifics around the trainings that are being offered, I would point you to the MassBERT site. And I know most folks are familiar with the CRAFT, but I'm just going to put here in the chat box a link to the S2BI in case you're not familiar with that. Um, I think more people here in Massachusetts are using it than other states, but if you're curious, I just sent it. Great, thank you. Um, and another question came in about um, nurses. So do you require a nurse with a BSN or are two-year RNs and LPNs administering the SBIRT questionnaire? That is a great question. I am happy to check in with folks at the Department of Public Health for a final answer on that, but I am not sure. Yeah, I would guess, Courtney, um, it's probably who the certification is relevant to the school nurses and then once, I mean, if they're a certified school nurse, I don't think there's additional, um, uh, you know, certifications required in addition to that. Like, I don't think there's an additional screening of the school nurses based on degree. I think once they're a nurse, then they're, they're able to do the screening, is that right? Yes. All right, great. And uh, one more. Are there any mechanisms in place to track compliance? Uh, for instance, the percentage of students that are actually screened? Yep, so the school districts are responsible for uh, asking all of the students the questions and tracking the responses in a form that has de-identified data. So the chart essentially has, uh, you know, if it's the craft, the questions, the pre-screen, whether or not they went on beyond the pre-screen, and if so, check boxes for the questions where the student said yes or no, and then I believe there's a space to comment on what the follow-up was if they were referred uh, or received a brief intervention. So at the bare minimum, the districts are filling that out for every single student who is screened, uh, and those are reported back to the Department of Public Health to ensure that the screenings are being done. Um, and you know, there's the opportunity to dig into the data that's collected there. Uh, I know there are a couple other projects being funded to study implementation in a few of the sites that I believe have a little bit more intensive data collection um, so that we have a little bit more of a snapshot of sort of the baseline and then what SBIRT looks like in the districts over the next couple of years. All right, great. Um, at this time, I don't, there haven't been any other questions that have come in. Um, so I want to thank you guys again for such a great webinar today.